I'll turn it over to Dustin for the Q&A. Uh, Dr. Philippon and Dr. Mack, a lot of people are interested in some details on FAI screening. And uh, you, each of you spoke about physical examination. Dr. Mack spoke about 3D biomechanics. When do you go from physical examination guiding your screening to deciding that uh, you need to step up and start with some imaging? And then how do you pick your imaging at that point? Uh, Dr. Philippon, do you want to take it first and then we'll switch over to Dr. Mack? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> um, the dynamic exam is a big part, I think, of the uh, resolution and understanding the conflict. So initially, we have a fast screening process, like I demonstrated with the Faber distance, the impingement test, uh, asymmetric range of motion. But sometime I have a, I can we can have a patient where there's a label separation uh, and sometimes I'm trying to quantify how big it is <clears throat> and what I like to do at that point because sometimes we try we have pay athletes especially they come in and they're trying to decide if they want to pursue their season or not pursue their season and sometimes what we'll do is we'll use the ultrasound and I think it's very effective use the ultrasound do an axial distraction test and also put the hip in flexion and just look at the conflict. See how large it can, how much displacement there is with the labrum. And if the labrum is not too unstable, sometimes we'll suggest to our patient, hey, let's get an injection, let's wait, let's work on our muscles, and we'll try to do this at the end of season. So for me, it's very helpful to do an ultrasound clinically just to decide if we should postpone the, the intervention, surgical intervention, or just try to stay conservative for a little while longer. Great, and Dr. Mack, do you have any additional comments on that question? So I would, I would agree with what Dr. Philippon has said. Um, I've had a similar experience and we use dynamic ultrasound as well in our clinics. Oftentimes we will get preoperative MRI. I don't personally do arthrogram. I haven't found it useful, but others have. I am a very big proponent of the diagnostic injection. Um, using corticosteroid injections under ultrasound guidance has been helpful to me if athletes need to get through a, a period of time. However, I, I do not allow them to have more than one and I caution them they cannot play within a few days of having the injection. So the numbing medication must be worn off to ensure that we are not masking any potential pain protective mechanisms of the hip. So in those two fashions, we try to get individuals through their, their ability to play their sport. That being said, um, obviously, ultimately, if the hip continues to be symptomatic and they are playing through pain to the point where they can't, then that becomes a surgical situation. So, Dr. Mack, you discussed the use of corticosteroids. What are your thoughts on the, um, and Dr. Philippon will bring this to you next, what are your thoughts on the current state of orthobiologics in, for FAI patients and for soft tissue lesions? And then the, the future, where do you think the future is taking us? Uh, Dr. Mack, we'll go to you first. Sure, so we, we do a fair amount of research on that, specifically where, as it pertains to the cartilage that I presented. And the conclusions we've had is, candidly, we're not there yet, but we probably will be. We have a number of trials going on currently where we can take individuals, uh, both polydactyly cells from kids that don't need it, we can culture them and are actually in an early clinical trial utilizing that, and that can be placed arthroscopically. As far as non-surgical biologic utilization, like PRP, stem cells, things like that, my own perspective is the data is not there yet as far as stem cells are concerned. Maybe it will be one day, we don't use it currently. As far as PRP is concerned, um, it has a role. Leukocyte poor PRP has been utilized well in my patients as well as others. As far as symptom management, it's not obviously going to protect the hip from damage or anything of that nature, but to get a hip to calm down, leukocyte poor PRP has decent success. It's something that we use ourselves. It also has very little chondrotoxicity, unlike corticosteroid injections. So we use that in our athletes for that reason. Dr. Philippon, I know your center is doing a lot of research in this area. What additional thoughts do you have, and especially looking towards the future? Yeah, I agree with Dr. Mack. I think um, right now we're starting a trial where we'll, uh, NIH run a trial where we'll look at the bone marrow aspirates uh, and look at the effectiveness on uh, the uh, cartilage regeneration. Also, we're very interested in synolytics. Uh, we're looking at it as well, uh, fisetin, quercetin. 
in pre-bone marrow aspiration to minimize the senescent cell and have a, a good yield of good stem cells. So we're we're doing a lot of research on that. Uh, what I do in my, in cer certain athletes, I'm not saying we have a 100% success rate. A lot of them to get them through the se season will do an ultrasound guide injection over the chondrolabral separation <clears throat> with PRP, uh, leukocyte poor. And we've had good success and maybe a third, a fourth of our, a uh, third to uh, a little more than, than a third of our patient with that. And that, what it does, in our opinion, create a little inflammation, a little scarring, and stabilize the chondrolabral junction temporarily. And I've had a few patients where we inject PRP and they, they can go on for a year or a year and a half and postpone surgery. Now, it's not going to treat the impingement, obviously, but it's a good way sometime. Uh, let's say the Olympic cycle, someone is ready for to go to Summer Olympic. Um, we'll try to get him through the Olympics if they get hurt a few months before because they cannot have surgery and get him through if, if it's possible. And, and as I said, for us in our hands, a little more than a third of our patients have a good response to that. A lot of people are interested in return to activity rates after hip arthroscopy. And from my experience in working uh, with both of you for a long time with Team USA athletes, I actually don't know of any athlete who did not return um, in our program, uh, which is pretty impressive and I, I don't think is in the literature. Um, but I know you guys know the literature by heart. Uh, Dr. Philippon, first, how does return to activity after hip arthroscopy look for elite athletes? Well, that's a that's a great question. Now, if we look, there's different cohorts. If you look at the pro athletes, we look we looked at it at by sports, and we've uh, published that in the American Journal of Sports Medicine and other medical journals. So we look at ice hockey players, for example. Ice hockey players are cohort in NHL hockey players return to play was 100%. Um, baseball player in the 90 plus percent return to play. Major League Baseball pleasure. NBA basketball player, uh, we just published that recently, 100% return to play. Uh, so I would say an NFL actually was a little lower. It's uh, I-80s. Overall, you could say that return to play at the professional level after an intervention like we do is at least 90% plus chance of return to play at the same level. Now, in the recreational athlete, might be a little different because you're dealing with different muscle uh, muscle structures, muscle strength, and training and all that. But overall, I'd say return to sports at the same level, it's, it's certainly around 90% plus. That's phenomenal. Uh, Dr. Mack, what additional thoughts do you have on that topic? I think you might be on so, mute, Dr. Yeah, Mack. There I, we yeah. go. So I, I would agree completely uh, with what Dr. Philippon said, and that's – it was the part of this talk that you just heard was the, the specific differences between recreational and professional athletes. And th there are very big differences. And I, I think it has to do with the stresses on their hip. And one would think that elite athletes have higher stressors and they do, but they also are far more able to accommodate and they have better neuro, neuromuscular kinematics. So our experience has been the same. The, the study that I quoted that showed a 74% return to sport, in my experience, that is unquestionably on the low end. And my experience has been the same as Dr. Philippon's, where we're, we're upwards in the middle, middle to high 90s. NBA athletes, interestingly, are a unique cohort, um, depending on the specific position you're in. It may have a higher or lower percentage, but I think elite athletes are unique, and surgery works when it's indicated when elite athletes extremely well. Yeah, and I, I would caution the audience that um, these results are definitely better when you have a very experienced surgeon. This is a fairly new technique, and they're inexperienced surgeons. And uh, we've seen that when we use very experienced hip arthroscopists, we see phenomenal results. Our next question is for uh, Dave. Dave, people had a lot of questions about the Athlete 360 program. Is it something that can be bought? How is it developed? Um, can you expand on the, the history and the current state of the Athlete 360 program? This is a bespoke program uh, where we've actually partnered with our team at Kinduct. Um, it started off the back of, as Dustin and I sort of presented in our, our presentation, that it was initially just a, a screening program um, that coupled with uh, something that inspired actually out of Roald Barr's uh, questionnaire that he mentioned earlier today, 
and then it's progressed across time. It just started with one team. Um, now we're servicing over 500 uh, Olympic and Paralympic athletes across probably uh, what we would say 17 different NGBs. And I heard that term mentioned earlier in 26 different sporting groups. Um, we're not quite to the whole of Team USA, but we're definitely our outreach is continuing to expand. And especially during this um, time where where sort of distance based training and contact with our athletes has been imperative in us understanding their, their wellness and their, their you know, individualized training load. All right, so we're, we're out of time for this panel. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mack and Dr. Philippon for everything you've done for Team USA. We're extremely appreciative of your, of your expertise and for your centers contributing to our national medical network. And uh, that's the end of this session. We're gonna kick it over to Charlie.